Good morning. Uh, thank you for being here again. This is lecture five on innovation via technology startups. Um, we've been more or less following the outline. And if you look for one lecture to the other, sometimes you'll see that it's changing a little bit. Um, for today, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the technology aspect um, and tie it together. Because last time I mentioned about sales and how you, you transition, how you look at your different market segments, how you interview your customers. So the first thing we'll do is kind of go back to that and make a few clarification. By now, I think you're very familiar with this chart uh, from Steve Blank on the process of making an innovation successful. Uh, first of all, you're really in searching mode and then you're in an execution. Um, so the sales process starts with the customer validation until they sent you a purchase order. You don't really know if they're willing to pay the amount that you're thinking of. And there was a discussion uh, after class last time about um, these early sales because at least in our case, our, our tool, our processes were not fully ready. So we were essentially selling the idea to evaluate how that would be helpful to them. You know, it, it, it wasn't data that they could use right away. It was us bringing our equipment, bringing our procedures um, to their facility to try it out and see and, and get their reaction. So the fact that they were willing to pay for that means that they had pain, that they, there was something that was missing in their system that they were willing to spend some R&D dollars towards making this. Uh, it's not all customers that will have any budget whatsoever, but we've talked about that last time. We said, you know, you have to identify those that I've, all, I've passed beyond the point of knowing that they have a problem. They've started working on the process of resolving their problem. So that really, at that point, their early sales is, yes, they, they, they will be able to use um, your tool and be able to talk about it. They're mostly going to be able to learn if this is going to help resolve their problem as opposed to fixing it right away. I mean, we're talking about business sales here. This is not... An individual says, well, I'm not going to buy your new bicycle if I can't ride it yet. You know, so, so in a context of business, you should be able to sell the idea that them, you bringing the bicycle to them to try it out, even if you have to drive it, is, is still a useful process because uh, it's how they can start thinking about how they're going to be able to use your solution, your technology for their use. So it's it, because all everything takes time. So if you're going to wait to involve your customer until you have a product, it's it, you, you won't you, you won't succeed most likely if it's a, something that's relatively complex because they won't know how to use it yet. And we have some of those people for us right now in our company. We have new people calling in and they have no idea what they what, what, what they what they're getting into. And the good thing for us is we've been through the process with other customers so we can actually teach them relatively quickly and get them up to speed. But if we had not made this learning of what their needs are, where their pain point and how they can work internally typically to, to start resolving it, that we would be at a loss there. We would not be able to connect with those uh, new callers. Um, so very on in the in the, in the process, this is just a, a reminder about the discussion we had about interviewing. We talked about how to get the people in to be able to ask them questions. And then um, these are politeness training. That was some, I, one aspect that I really emphasized at the end of the class. And I know that these are long lectures, so I don't know if you are still really paying attention. But it's very, very important not to put your customer in a position where they feel they have to say yes. Right, <laughs> you're not giving them to say. I've worked on this so hard, and this is where we are. You know, are you aren't you interested? You know, type of type of situation. That's not going to give you a, a much useful information. So, you pretty much want to detach yourself uh, from all the work that you've done to learn the most that you can. And that really, I created a slide for you guys, and I'm. 
I, in the, the, uh, the counterside to that is I may change it from, from your feedback or in the future. So what I did here is emphasize how important it is to learn from your customer. Um, and then I put a selling chart <laughs> for, for comparison. So we have a little bit of a framework here to, on, on our thinking process. So the idea is you always want to learn, okay? That's, it's, uh, you, but sometimes there's a point where you just can't make as many changes. So that, that's why when you come into the customer creation, I put the learning curve below the selling curve because you still want to pay attention, but your goal at that point is to make sales. So this is a little bit showing my point of view on the evolution on, on the process. So when you're trying to discover the need and whether your technology can fulfill it for that market segment, you're not selling at all. Now, there is a point where you are trying to get a buy-in in the customer validation. You're trying to get a purchase order, okay? You are. So to some extent, you are in a sale mode, but the, 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 the selling point at that point is a validation of the concept. You know, would that really be helpful to you for your big problem? And that's how you need to present it. You can't present it like we're ready to go. This is, this is going to you know, change your business this year. It's more, well, we've been working on this and we need your input and we can't just you know, make everything free for you. So are, are you interested to evaluate where we are and, and give us feedback type of situation? Yes. Okay, so there was a question which is it seems unreasonable to some extent to ask for money if you're not ready to provide the solution, right? That's, that's, that's kind of the question. And believe me, I was faced with it for the longest time. <laughs> so um, I think that, um, I mean, you never really ask for money. You say that you want to work with them. And then, of course, working with them costs money, and you can't afford it all because you are a small startup company. So that, to some extent, that's a little bit the difference. It's not saying, hey, you know, we have this trial here. Do you want to buy it? Uh, that's, that won't work, right? It's, it's more, well, you know, we've been here two or three times already explained to you our technology. We feel that it would be a great time for you to step in and give it a trial. As far as where we are right now, this is what we can do. It's going to take this much time. You know, can you? Can we do? Can we work something out and uh, see what happens? You know, in, in our case, I'll, I'll describe. We have two technologies. Our second technology, we had a customer that said, "I really, really like this. You know, I want you to focus on this." And I said, "I'm sorry, I can't completely focus on it, but I can work on it at the same time if if you really want us to do some work for you." And they said yes. So you know, we sent a proposal a year later. They came back with a budget. That's the type of time frame that you may be looking at if it's research and development. So you're never too early to throw your ideas out. Yes? Uh, can you explain why the learning from the customer plateaus off? Does that assume that they tell you the whole story up front? Because from what I see, oftentimes it'll drop off, but then they'll, they'll switch the question yep. to you. Very good question. Very good question. So Brian asked, uh, why is it a plateau curve? And the, the, the very quick reason is I didn't want to try to make a funny shape here. And also, it's not the outcome, it's the effort. This plot shows your effort in trying to learn. And you will not learn <laughs> in a steady fashion. There will you know, be peaks in there. But it's, uh, what I'm saying is you have to constantly work on it. You can't just say, oh, for two months, I already have my work uh, cut off, so I'm not going to try to talk to the customer. I'm not going to that conference because I already have what I need. That's never happening. It, you always want to learn. So that, does that help clarify a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I didn't want to make any funny shapes here. I just wanted to explain the idea that on the very first stage in customer discovery, you are not trying to sell, then yes, you are starting. But with the, with, the, with the framework, that's a little different in saying, yeah, you know, why don't you give it a try so we both learn from it? Because we're doing our part, 
of working on your problem. I mean, that's, it's, it's the truth, and, that, and that's what you have to put your mindset into. And I, that's something actually that I did not emphasize in classes. A, if you are a technology startup or involved or you see a technology startup, it's tough, right? I described that to you. It's really, really tough. And people, if you explain exactly what you're doing, they'll be wanting to help. They, they, they will want to help. I mean, we've, we've got help on every aspect of our company from, um, yeah, the, the whole entire process. Um, you don't want to um, just go to, you know, an accountant and say, hey, you know, whatever it costs, I need this. No, you, you have to negotiate what's the minimum that you, that they'd be willing to, to do for you that's going to meet the requirements because you're in this trying to get there mode. Yes? Okay, so there's a question about the commitment to the first people writing your check. Um, it's good business practice to always go back to the people that have helped you. You don't have any obligation, but yeah, I mean, I, if you, to the extent that um, a customer comes in early and support you, it, it's, a, it's a charter customer. It's a member of the club, and when they call, they are more important than, than somebody else, of course, yes. Now, there is a balance. If, they, if they're not helping you at all anymore, <laughs> then you have to find some new good customers to focus on. So it's just, it's just business. But, you know, if, like for example, this year we have one main customer and we're going to do our best to make it work for them. For us, it's going to be easier to service that customer next year anyway, right? And there is no way that they're not going to be part of the plan and be able to do exactly what they want when they want it, you know, because they were, they were in the process early on. And it's easier for us to work with them. Okay, it's a very good question. So the question about was about a customer trying to lock you up and saying, because I've helped you so far, we are the most important customer to you. And uh, it's a very, very delicate balance because it depends if what they are providing you is enough to support you and to achieve your own goals. I mean, at the end of the day, you're a startup company, you have your own goals and you have to make sure that that's still the top priority and then you have your customer goals, of course, that are very important. Um, the customers are extremely important, but their goals are not necessarily your goals, of course. Yeah, that, if you start thinking that way, you may, you may run into a problem. Because their goal typically is year by year. <laughs> and you're there for the long run. So one example related to that is, yeah, if a customer says, you know, I want you to be my priority, but they don't provide the volume that you need right now. That, that is a problem. You know, you have to figure out a way how to address this. You may have to say, well, you'll have to tell me ahead. If you want to be in you know, a schedule, a work schedule, you have to tell us a little bit more ahead. We can't be, you know, just on call for you if, if we already have work that's been committed months earlier with somebody else. And they, essentially, communication is very important. Um, that's how you, you manage to, and, and early communication, like for example, like a couple of months ago, that was the discussion, it was, well, what do you want to do? If you don't know, <laughs> we may or may not have the capacity to, to work with you uh, th this year. So um, th those discussions do need to take place. Um, and it's part of this process of selling to some extent. It's, it's funneling identifying the different sources of work, of, of revenues, of progress with, with, your, with your innovation. The question about when you get the attorneys involved, oh boy, depends which attorney because you need a lot of them. Attorneys are very important in the process of setting up your team, uh, developing your intellectual property, and then contracts. Those are kind of three different aspects here that, uh, at least in our case, are three different attorneys. Um, okay, so you were been 
constantly asking about what I did. And this is a really right time to demonstrate to you the importance of still paying attention to what the customer is saying. So um, I go out there, present our story, trying to get some work. You, we get some customers say, yeah, we'll do some work with you this year. We have these pipes over there. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. But by the way, could you do something else for me? Okay, could, could you help me with something else? And you want to be paying attention to that when you can, when it's early on enough, because that could affect your strategy. So I'll describe um, very briefly, and I took some slides here from two years ago, how we were describing our innovation and how it would affect uh, the customer. We told our customer, you know, instead of taking samples out of your pipeline, we're going to test it while it's running. What do you think of that? <laughs> and the answer was, we're interested. So you, know, and you start describing a little bit how you're going to do it. So at, in that point, we were saying, we're well, just going to put a magnetic device there. It's going to run a nice test. It's, it's, it's cutting edge technology. It works very nicely. It's got some self-adjusting system because technically what I was saying about engineering, the big innovation, so the first real uh, apparatus or patent that we filed as a company has been uh, on ways when we run the test on the pipe. Let's say the pipe's not even fully round because um, it has a welded seam, so it may be, have a little bump here. I'm exaggerating, but not that much. So pipes are not perfect. They've been seam welded here. So let's see, this is the inside of it. Who knows exactly what's going on? Maybe there's a little weld reinforcement. So our test is scribing the surface. So we come with styluses, and we move around here. And the idea, see, we were the first one doing this, is to make a good test, you want your stylus to stay perpendicular to the pipe. If you can't do that, you're not very helpful. So traditionally, what people have done is you have a stylus, you have a big machine, so, and then you put your sample underneath of it. So that's your test piece. So it's set perpendicular by, the, by the, the process of putting the sample under the machine. We're doing the opposite. We are bringing the equipment to the sample. And there are multiple ways to do this right. The one that I described initially was a tripod system. So what you see here, we call these floats. These are touching the sample. So let's say I'm testing over here. So I have floats in front and in the back. And this is what's connected to my frame. It allows me for this component to stay perpendicular to the pipe. Completely new. That, that's granted because there, there, there's nobody that thought about doing it this way. Now. You ask about making the link to the other module on intellectual property. So the process here of the patent is you have to make it enabling. So you have to be able to describe your technology well enough that somebody else could build it when they get allowed to do that in 15, 20 years, depending when you start to count the clock. Um, so was it important to the customer? No, I'm mentioning it in class because we, we talked about tying this in. If we tell them it's going to work and it's been proven in the lab, they don't really need to know all of this. Now, if you don't have anything else to talk about for 25 minutes <laughs> in a presentation because you, you're so early in the discovery process, yeah, you can get them excited about how motivated you are. I mean, that could work. Um, but you, you definitely want to focus on them pretty quickly. Um, so focusing on them, they really needed to know that we're testing pipes, <laughs> okay? That we're not just in the lab. So here's the uh, surface of the pipe. So back two years ago, I was explained to them, see, you know, we don't damage the pipe because that's the, that was always the first question. You know, are you, are you making big grooves into the, the pipe? And the answer is no. 
it. You want to show it. So here you get the fingerprint right there in the image. It looks almost as big as the, uh, the grooves that we're making themselves. And the, for your, all you guys engineers, we go to a depth that is less than a half a percent of the pipe wall thickness. So it's, it doesn't make any difference. We're talking about pipes that have some corrosion, uh, have some uh, anomaly bumps for just from the manufacturing. So it wasn't a problem. Now, what gets very complicated here to some extent, and again, this is just a copy. Um, so we, we're saying from this test, you get a pull test curve. So you get what you would obtain normally in the lab. And that's not very well explained here. This is just the way it is. But for you guys, essentially, each time that we profile those two grooves, in this case, that are made, we're able from those just those two groups of where the blue line is to make a stress drain curve. And what that means is we're able to see the evolution of yield strain during the test, which is very, very unique. Essentially, you just plot an evolution. So when you go over that weld here, you're able to pick up uh, the signature of the weld. Um, then there's a little story on how it works. Um, Frictional sliding uh, on, on the surface of the metal gets you into a steady state. So for a certain load applied of the stylus, this is a cone, you form this pileup on, on the side. And very intuitively, if it's, uh, let's say it's wet snow, it's going to harden when, when you deform it. So it won't make much of a, a bank on the side of the street. If it's a flurry of snow that's not consolidating, then you make a big, a big snow bank on the side. So there is a strong effect of the work hardening of the metal on that behavior here in frictional sliding. So we're able to differentiate between the initial yield strength and the, the work hardening behavior. So this is all done in the computer. So when we run the test with our special equipment, we're able to translate the broad data that we get, and that's what we collect. We collect essentially the width of those grooves that we make, so that profile here. So from peak to peak, we used to look at that. We don't anymore, it's too complicated for the moment. And uh, we use that information to get our values. So one thing that was very important for the customer is yeah, they wanted to see some results. So these are four different steels where we show that the error in the yield strength is within 5% of the uh, of the laboratory test value which is plenty accurate because you could take a cut out a pipe send it to one lab send it to the other lab and get this type of variation so a, a five percent difference is is really not significant for this industry but that was something that we've learned more from them as opposed to us saying it so this is where the, uh, the customer aspect becomes very important so I'm there presenting this and trying to get some traction, trying to get a few of these people to say, I'm going to do some work with you. And then um, here's the type of answer I get. Oh, yeah, if you're going to give it to me, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> you know, so, 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 so you'll, you'll face that in the majority of the time. Then you really question, you'll realize that, yeah, they don't have a budget for you. If, 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 you, if you're coming a Santa Claus and tell them the, the strain of their pipe, they'll take it. But as far as going through the process of qualifying you, finding budget for you, and integrating you into their process, uh, that may or may not happen any quickly. Um, so now you start to figure out what will make them do something. And this here is general, not just our case at all. Uh, if, if you find a customer that saves money, like definitely at the end of the year, they have a bigger profit because of using you, you're in luck because that's an easy sell, okay? If you can make a business case that they just save money right away, good luck. Um, it wasn't our case because they were not doing a lot of cutouts on those pipes. They were essentially not learning the, the material properties in a standard process. 
So what makes them want to do something new if they can't save money becomes more complicated. So reputation I put on there. So a big company, they may not want to have a big leak. You know, the, uh, the Macondo big, big blowout in the Gulf of Mexico wasn't really good for the, for, for the oil, oil company that um, was in charge of that project. You know, it just lasts for years and years and years and years. So there is an aspect here in the, these big companies of decision making, if there's risk involved, they will put a dollar figure on risk. They're not going to completely ignore it. So uh, that's one aspect. And then regulatory compliance in aviation, that's the biggest thing. If you, if you can't get regulatory compliance, what you're doing is not useful. If you can, exactly how you do it is not that important anymore because you've passed very, very high standards at that point. Um, so for our case and the oil and gas industry, i say in general, it's been in between. There is regulation and then there is standard practice. And the standard practice can be above or slightly below the regulation, depending on what exactly the situation is. And um, it's just been this way. I, I think it's a fair statement for offshore, uh, upstream, downstream, uh, all across the industry. Nothing is perfect. There's a lot of risk associated with transporting oil and gas, really. And um, how they handle risk depends on um, regulation and the individual companies as well. So I think you see where I'm going here. Now you're realizing you have a great idea, and unless you can really make this case strongly for the risk, or if you can make the case through the regulation, you may or may not get to the finish line of having them give you a lot of revenues for, for your innovation. So I had fear. <laughs> I had fear because when I started MMT, there was this chart here from the Department of Transportation saying there's going to be a new regulation that's going to require to test the strength of the pipeline. And it sounded like a really good assumption that if there's this chart, this process, this disclosure to the public, that it will take place. But when you realize on this chart, it says 2013. So the history here is in, in, in 2010, there was a big explosion in San Bruno, California that led a lot of investigation by NTSB um, to make recommendation to the Department of Transportation as to what to do with aging pipelines. They did that. It took a year or two. Then they put the draft regulation. So I was sitting there in 2016, three years later, after this was drafted, and it wasn't moving much yet. Uh, there hadn't been you know, a real industry discussion as to how those rules will actually be implemented. Um, to uh, be very truthful, before our solution and somebody else's solution. So to be able to do this test without cutting the pipe, today there are three ways. Back in 2013, there were hardly any way that was considered validated accurate enough. So there, there was some technology reason why it sat there for a while. And Department of Transportation was submitting for re request for a proposal to do research to find ways to do a non-destructive test, just kind of like the one we did. We weren't there yet. We had no idea. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so. When we got involved, there was already one other alternative that had been essentially used uh, for a certain application, uh, but it was not being used much still. So you, you are in this situation where you say, even if I get my technology package so I can run the test in the field, how certain I am that it's going to be used a lot? And the answer pretty much came, well, it's going to be used a lot only with the new regulation. It's a, it's a pretty tough bet uh, back then. So just started thinking. <laughs> um, and I, I want to go back to these 
slides here because it's very important that if you if you're gonna do something, you're gonna be willing to take risk and deal with it in the best way you, you can. I mean, this doesn't have to be all that slow. Uh, we did not pick to back then to do the testing of pipelines uh, because you know it was a hit or miss. There was a good belief at the time that we started that this was going to happen, but then nothing happened for over a year, and I started getting worried. So what did I do? I decided to think about other things that the customer said. So one of the things they would always ask us was, can you do something for my toughness? So you have strength, that's the stress strain curve, and you have fractured toughness, that's for the resistance to a flaw, uh, a crack. Uh, so very, I guess, very specifically, if you don't know your material property, one of the first thing that you're always going to need is your stress strain curve here. So you got your yield strength, you got your ultimate tensile strength, and now you know something at least about how they intended to, to, to make the material in the first place. The fracture toughness is a different concept that most of you are going to be very familiar with. So you start with, let's say, a compact tension specimen that already has a crack in it of a certain size. So you have a little flaw. And then the question is, what is still the loading capacity for that sample with a, with a, with a crack to completely fracture? So here we're talking about essentially a KC for the material. Um, and there's this very simple relationship that essentially relates to your flaw size and the actual material property, the resistance for any material. If it's, say, it's glass or ceramic, very, very little number here, very high number there. So those two pieces of information come important for different applications in pipeline. The application that the customer was very, very interested in, the reason that they ask you, and you have to work this in, is if there is a crack on the pipeline and it really explodes, that's really, really, really bad. Um, and therefore, they were specifically seeking out a solution for this, regardless of the details of regulation. Here, the very quick story is they were not making the news uh, very often for something related to that. This is more for operation to avoid small leak, to really know what the material is, to be able to optimize your system, but it's not as related to a catastrophic failure. So, let's say you're in my position. <laughs> you had this idea, and you, you got a team working on it to, to make it into a device. Then you start thinking about what's gonna happen in the next two years you could definitely provide this, but you don't know how much they're going to buy it. It'd be great to do this, but you don't have any idea how you would do that. So what do you do? In my case, I'll call it risk mitigation. <laughs> I said, there's a big commercial risk here we're vested in it. We're going to be getting some government funding to, to be able to move forward here. So this is going. But, hey, if we have a little one guy on the team trying to find a way to do this, that would be great. Because if, if somehow this doesn't work, it's for the same customer. It'd be roughly the same tool. So we could just switch one for the other if we really, really had to. That was the idea. So before even thinking about how to run the test for this second idea I had, I really <laughs> did the effort based on the, on the customer. And I mentioned in the class about ideas that you have to eventually work really hard and force yourself. So the idea here is, was we're working so hard, we can't lose our focus to, to get this technology out there. But again, if we can have another idea that could be replaced if needed be, uh, it'd be great. So what I did is I started thinking myself and instead of having a, a very blunt stylus, so the one that 
I'm showing here, just blunt and, and, and plowing the, the, the surface essentially. I started thinking, what if I had a special shape? So you see a boat here with a spreader at the bottom. So I said, I'm going to spread the material and force it to crack on the surface. That's kind of the idea. And um, I couldn't spend much time. We had uh, other things going on. You can see maybe from the top view, so just stretching the material. Uh, it, it was hard to believe that building it would make it work very easily. So this one, we never really built a, a physical prototype. But what I did is uh, MMT, my company, did sponsor a capstone project at Northeastern University. And uh, they, you can see here they were looking at forming uh, chips. So here you actually create a surface because that's what happened in cracking, right? In cracking, you have new surfaces that are created. So it was an idea from somebody else to use essentially cutting force to get an idea of fracture toughness. Um, I was trying to be very positive as the, 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 the kind of the resource or the sponsor of the program, but I didn't believe in it. And the reason I didn't believe in it is this is introducing a lot of shear in the material, which is very, very different than the tension. But it turns out I was coming back from teaching, actually, and I had an idea. And it was, again, I think it was mostly based on all the work, all the thinking I had done for about six months now into how I could possibly create tension on the surface of my test piece. So, this was the idea. So, modifying a, the cutting tool with a little opening in it, just like a fork. Uh, if you have a fork and you go to, through cheese between the fingers of the fork, you're going to stretch the cheese and you, and you may fracture it, actually. Um, so, what you see is the same process of making a, a ribbon, but with the opening, in that opening, it's like a peel test. So it forces the material to deform until you form a fracture. So you see it here. Um, this is a fracture surface on the aluminum and on steel from just running the tool through it, no, no instrumentation. And the, the basic idea there was to use, well, there's so many ways, but one simple way to learn from this is to look at the height of the fracture with respect to the cutting plane, and that tells you how much blunting of the tip of the crack you had. Very limited level of effort to that point. So what we're talking about here is there's a crack, but if you look at the microscopic level, the crack is blunted at the tip because it's, there is plasticity there if, it, if it's a piece of steel, and the opening of that area and this is, see, this is where you actually fracture, is directly related to your fracture toughness. The more you're going to blunt before you fracture, the better your fracture toughness. It's a linear relationship between that opening and the fracture surface. So I knew this from background. You know, I've been learning this at school. That was my undergrad. And then I did a lot of experiment, a lot of experience. But I think one of the key points here is I was still listening, all right? I, I got it that this may or may not work, and then I decided to mitigate that risk by having an alternate solution to another problem for the same customers, knowing that it takes years to build these relationships with the customer. If all you need to do is change the detail of the, what's under the machine, that would be a year as opposed to an extra three years. Uh, we have not had to use it. so. In terms of intellectual property, uh, in this process here, when, when the student showed me this, I kept it to myself. <laughs> okay, Not because I was shy to share the idea, but because I knew I needed time. Because by the time you file a provisional application, I got a year to do your non-provisional. And that costs money. And it also requires you to really have an enabling solution that's, that, that's, that is buildable or implementable by somebody with reasonable knowledge in that field. And um, we could have said, oh yeah, we're there, but instead 
didn't talk about it, and you can see the first filing was in December 2015. So that is a little more over two years ago. And we've done some work. So just after filing, we started sending some stuff to the machine shop to start doing something like this. Then we managed to get those surfaces. And then, then we started talking to the customer because we had a laboratory proof of concept that this was not just smoke. <laughs> That's how we felt we needed to do this, with, also to maintain our reputation, because other people using indentation testing have been saying, we'll give you some toughness number, and it doesn't work. It's been established over and over again. So if you say, I'm going to do this, they'll say, well, I don't believe you anymore, because <laughs> other people have been you know, using that sales pitch to us before. So by the time we talked about it, we actually had a little physical model. I can bring that as well. It really created a lot of attention at the international conference. And the, the, to, to finish that story is can't change priorities. If you have a tool that's almost ready to go, you can't underestimate then the amount of effort to build the next tool, you, you, because you have that experience, you know you, you build something and, and it's not going to work. And that's why we're going to spend a little time now talking about really how we build things. But any, any questions related to that? Because that's just trying to mitigate risk and also listen to the customer. Yes? Do you ever think about going to the regulators and saying, like, hey, you've had this rule in the works for a while, uh, but you haven't implemented it because of technology. I, I can now do what you want, so make a rule, and then all of a sudden you have almost a monopoly. OK, there was a question about uh, going to the uh, Department of Transportation, explaining to them what we did. And of course we did that. That's, that's very important to the, to, to the extent if they're the customer, you need to talk to your customer. You just have to find the time when you're ready to do that. And, um, and at this point, um, Yes, the, the federal regulator are very aware of what we have. They come and see us at conferences. And uh, they, they, they actually, so on, on that story, they passed the, the recommendation for, for the rule. It's, it was all written up, and there was a big committee meeting involving the industry, the government, and the public. And at this point, they all said, we have to do this. This, this is no brainer. Because there are alternatives. Not only they can't pass a law with just one person, being able to do the works, but there are alternatives that are not all as good, but they all work to some extent. Good question. OK, so now technically, we haven't talked about how you build stuff, but I decide to go ahead and start with what the NSF uh, taught me to do, is you have to realize you have to move fast. Because in all this process, we talked about learning, right? You, this is. This is your customer discovery. Between the time you learn and the time that you start selling, there's very little time. So you have to really, really make everything happen very, very quickly. So something to remember, not only in the context of startup, but in general, is if you keep trying, you're more likely to be successful. And that really, really applies to prototyping. So I'm giving, just going back to the example here with the little wedge I showed you, the idea came up, we did nothing. And the first thing we did was run a test in the lab. And we've learned right away what was going to work and what was not going to work and how hard it was going to be. Uh, it took two months. That's fine. Okay, you can afford to spend some money running some tests so you learn quickly. You don't just stay stuck with your ideas and what you think is going to work and what is not going to work. So to be able to move quickly, you have to be able to learn to make mistakes. And that's tough, but it's really, really important. If you think this is the answer, go ahead and try it. Um, that's how you're going to learn very, very quickly. It's, it's, I can't emphasize it enough, the value of being able to go to the lab or go to your customer, because you have to do both, and validate your guesses. Um, and there was a big question that I tried to answer on how you do things. You know, how do you decide your market segment? How do you decide um, what you're going to be working on, what you're going to be focusing on? And it, there's a lot of cloudiness. I showed you the cloud earlier here. 
So you go back and forth with your ideas and you try a number of things and then eventually you move ahead. In our case, every six months or so, we pushed ahead. We said, we, we've done enough thinking, we've argued enough about all this stuff, now we're gonna build something. It's not gonna be perfect, but we are going forward. So this process here, in my mind, about gathering ideas, trying a few little of them, and discussing a bunch of things, turn into a new generation of equipment um, over time. Um, very difficult. Very difficult to be able to build something and admit to yourself all the problems it has <laughs> within a few months and then work on fixing them and, and giving it another shot. So I, that's the way that I see this iteration process. Our situation was no easy because this looks like a great idea, but then you start putting the pieces together. This needs to be really hard so it doesn't wear. So guess what, it may break. Uh, this guiding system may wear as well. There's so many things that you don't know until you've tried it, you've tried it, you've modified it, and you've tried it again. It's unbelievable. Now, when you start feeling good <laughs> is when from one tool, let's say you're looking at this one here in 2016 to this one, now you don't change everything, <laughs> okay? Because at the very beginning, we were pretty much redesigning the entire tool every time that we were building something. But when you start having things that are good enough, yeah, you keep them. <laughs> you don't just keep working, working harder and harder and harder. Um, so that, it's a very, very brief story here. The process, in our case, of making the tool the very first time here in 2015, we wanted to produce results for our first conference. We needed to show something. So said, this is not a lab, this is actually attached to the pipe, and we're gonna make it much better, but for now, it's attaching to the pipe. So you see the little square there? It's literally uh, a telescopic tubing pre-drilled that we just put a bracket there. So that took, that took one day to make that bracket. And then we were on and actually doing our, our, our test. Then we thought we would be very smart and look much better with magnets. That was the worst mistake. It was just too early. It was too early to try to include that, but we didn't know. We started getting all sorts of noise in our system and not being able to acquire data. And we, and, but at the same time we were having that, we were also breaking styluses, wearing this, and we had a lot of friction in our system. So nothing, <laughs> nothing was really, really working. You can't just blame one thing. But guess what? We've learned four, four things at once, okay? So, so to some extent, it was just a healthy process to just go and do it. Um, but it's very hard. Yes? Other than the um, things, the chart that you showed, was there anything um, from API, like 571 Fitness for Service, that kind of gave you an idea that this was another area of revenue you wanted to get into? There's a question. I think uh, the question is related to the two technologies we have, one for yield strength and one for toughness, and, and how we knew more here what the demand was going to be. Is that, so, so here, we were more dependent on the regulation, even though some of our customers said clearly they were going to do this when it was ready. Okay? So we knew that there was going to be work for us here. It's just a question of volume, long-term volume. Here, yes, there is an API 579 on fitness for service that does apply to pipeline that you have to put an input in there and if you don't have a value, you're, you're, you're guessing and you're guessing on something that can have a lot of difference between one asset and another asset so it's not a good idea to do that. Um, but re related to this, yeah, this, is, this one is really, it's this tool. It's gone through five or six, it's six iteration right now, completely rebuilding it with something that looks different. And um, at this point, we don't change it that much. We, we, we add springs that we replace with hydraulic. It should work, right? It's, it's not a huge change. We've changed some bearings for flexures and things like that. They're very, very important. But at the end of the day, um, the architecture of the system is not changing because it passed blind testing. So we'll, we'll start again next time with this chart. And I'll explain more details, but let's go through it very briefly. So we've talked about the learning, about the selling. 
So I put a, ch a chart here for prototyping that you have to start early on because yeah, it's going to take a t it's going to take time, and you want to make it very very simple at the beginning so you can learn fast. You make very simple prototypes. Then when you start the selling process, when you make these proof of concept, you're learning. You're learning how to put together a purchase order. You have to find an attorney. You have to go through all these processes. And then eventually, and that's what we've been doing in our case, you have to start building your technology. And that's, that's a different process than the prototyping process. So we'll spend a little more time on that next time. Thank you.